On this episode, we visit Zurich. We look at changes in two neighborhoods when heavy traffic was removed. Then we look at a new development by the Swiss Railway. Finally, how will autonomous vehicles impact pedestrians? Stay tuned. We're in Zurich talking with Monica Lischer. What's your organization? Um, our organization is uh, Pedestrian Mobility Switzerland and we are working in Zurich since nearly 40 years. What is it that you do? Uh, actually, I'm quite new at this organization. I'm working there um, till uh, August. It means I started two months ago. And we're doing quite a lot of things. On one hand, we are uh, kind of the NGO. So we are based um, uh, bottom up, um, in a bottom up movement, uh, movement, let's say like that. And on the other hand, we're doing um, uh, research, we are consulting um, planners, we are consulting um, villages, communities, yeah, and what are we doing? Yeah, we, we are also um, consulting legal cases, for example, villages or uh, communities or groups which uh, who are concerned about their rights or um, if the crossing of the street is not possible anymore so we are doing these legal things also because um, in Switzerland there is a national uh, law for pedestrians we have uh, certain rights and our organization has to provide uh, and plan or support the planning of these uh, pedestrian issues. What's this little plaza we're next to? We are here at the Bruppacher Platz, it's a new pocket park of Zurich, or new, it's now, um, yeah, um, it's, it was created in 2012 or 13 maybe, and um, it's a new park because, or the possibility of this new park or pocket park um, was given because of the reorganization of the traffic um, around Zurich. Um, before or till 2009, um, there was uh, a highway or three highways um, which were cutting the city apart and all the traffic um, yeah, was in the middle of the city. And this, this street was one X of this highway, the West Tangente, called in Swiss German or in German and they um, reorganized the traffic and that's why we could close down the street and build this pocket park. What process was involved in getting the city to decide to close a highway? Yeah, maybe I start, I do start earlier. Um, in Switzerland I think um, as in a lot of countries around the world, there was this image or imagination of highways uh, all over the cities and all over the country. And that's why um, the government of Switzerland uh, plans the national highway uh, highways till um, in the middle of the city. They, there should be a knot where all these uh, highways were uh, came um, together but actually it never that never happened um, because there was resistance in the cities or it started resistance in um, even in, in the in the 1970s early 1970s there started all uh, a resistance or, um, and that's why um, the realization did not uh, happen and Yeah, then we had this resistance for quite a few years and we have had these temporary streets. Um, there were a lot of temporary streets for this traffic of the highway because the highways were there and the cars and all the motori motorization was there and the cars had to cross the city and there was no highway. So um, the cars were crossing the city 
roads on on ordinary main roads they were not constructed constructed for for this amount of traffic there were about the fifty thousand or fifty five thousand um, cars a day uh, in the middle of the city and really close to the buildings and they were cutting the districts and after a while or after <laughs> after nearly 40 years the government um, the village uh, the, um, the government the city and the canton that's the region in Switzerland they decided to reorganize it all and they built a kind of a ring route highway around the city and after they built that um, they could start with the reorganization in the city and with this reorganization they started also um, um, the planning of, of new pocket parks it was I think in 2004 5 when the city hired Jan Gehl quite early I think for a European city to consult them how to reorganize the city how to build a, a city for human beings and not only for traffic and infrastructure yeah so they had this new strategy um, which was quite human centered let's say like that and at the same time they had the reorganization of the streets so it was a pretty good match I think and they could profit or we all profit um, of this good match and of this um, strategy let's say like that um, so they decided to build this new pocket park and at the same time they rearranged the streets they removed um, one line now it's one line there were two lines for uh, this 50,000 um, cars a day um, and now there is just one line and it's it's uh, one line um, with uh, a limit of speed of 30 kilometers per hour so it's quite slow and there is a priority for the active mobility which means for uh, pedestrians and cyclists and yeah the the speed or velocity is now quite um, low or lower and there's possibility to live actually on these streets because streets are public spaces and are the nerves of the city and it's quite important to have the opportunity to to walk to be there to sit there to do um, the daily practice yeah. yeah. What difference has it made for the people who, who do live along this street? Yeah, it's, it's always different, difficult to say what difference it is for, for, for people. Um, but mm, we did a, a study about this, um, this reorganization and about these uh, new places, because there were a few of them, um, to evaluate the success or the failure of, of this reorganization and then we also uh, did a few interviews with people uh, living along this street and also with shop owners and it, this was quite this was in the beginning of the of the new um, new uh, situation in 2013 and 2014 and in the beginning um, a lot of people were really relieved on one hand really you couldn't you, you can't believe it how relieved they were because it was quiet and the dirt was gone and the noise was gone and, and, and the cars were gone and they have suddenly this new space in front of their doors and they were able to let their windows open and just they could breathe and move and be and I think the relief was big and they were really happy about that. On the other hand, there was a certain fear because everybody knew after 40 years of negle ne neglection um, the real estate market would, would react also and maybe um, they were not able to, to keep their apartments or flats anymore because of, of higher, higher prices or, or higher uh, rents. And it was a bit both, but generally they were relieved. And the shop owners, it was quite interesting because um, as you can observe it quite everywhere around, everywhere around the world, in the beginning a lot of shop owners are firstly a bit um, 
uh, yeah, they are a bit, they, they do hesitate if they like the new arrangement without cars because they fear, okay, we'll, there will be no customer anymore. But a lot of studies, <laughs> or uh, as uh, a lot of studies has, <laughs> has proven about 30 years now, uh, the profit will be be higher um, without the, all these cars because pedestrians they are <laughs> the better customers <laughs> and they were really s not so amused at the first sight because for example this shop around there um, they were not happy and now they have two stores so it must be a, or there must be a certain profit <laughs> and there are um, other things happening in this district now um, the people and the children are, are um, appropriating the places so I think it's a good thing for the people they can live here and as you can see it also on, on uh, a lot of um, buildings um, the ground floors are, um, have completely changed there are active edges now and you can see there is a certain dialogue um, between the inner and outer side of, of the buildings. Um, for example, you have this uh, or one of the famous uh, ice cream shops behind us, um, which, which is a, a point of attraction for not only the people of the district, but nearly for half of the city. And they are and now it's not, not summer anymore, but in summer this plaza is crowded with people um, just uh, yeah, standing in front of this uh, gelateria and eating, chatting, yeah. So I think it's a big improvement for, for the people in the district and nobody can imagine anymore how it was 10 years ago. So where are we now? Now we are at the Bullingerplatz. It's also a small pocket park or a small plaza at the former West Tangente, at the former highway which was crossing the, the city. What was this place like when the highway was still here? There was no place. <laughs> it was just a street, a street with two lines and um, there was one crossing behind you and there was nearly no possibility to cross the street like that. It, it, it was nearly impossible to cross the street because of the cars and yeah, it was impossible, I think. And there was not, no way to enjoy um, a morning like this. You couldn't hear the fountain. It was not possible to sit outside and it was not possible to enjoy the, the city. Yeah. And what's it like now? <laughs> yeah, now um, you have another small um, pocket park and um, it is a plaza which is really appropriate now by people, by uh, customers of the cafe and it's, it's a real uh, space for people in the city and it's a place for people and not only a street for a street for cars. And I think um, a good sign was in the beginning when they transformed this street or this plaza, they created this plaza, the people um, were reclaiming for benches or they were uh, reclaiming for their space. Yeah, they appropriated the, their place with flower boxes and that's why um, the cars couldn't drive or cross this plaza anymore. So. How else does the neighborhood change other than the creation of a you know, pocket park and, a, and, and the pl plaza becoming lively with people all of a sudden? Yeah, I think the whole place changed. Mm, first of all, there were no cars or not so many cars anymore because uh, it is forbidden to, to uh, drive mm, uh, faster than 20 kilometers per hour it's kind of shared space now it's not only a plaza but a really a shared space where pedestrians are first and this changed the whole attitude of the people which are living here or still living here i think there was also a certain change in the neighborhood because uh, yeah the there was a change uh, 
I think on another change there was a, a rise of the of the rental fees also and that comes always along with a certain change of the neighborhood because before um, or it was a long time a quite neglected district or let's say like that all the districts around this West Tangente this highway were quite neglected and not really good districts to live there were a lot of immigrants or students or people with low income incomes and it was really um, um, a deprived neighborhood let's say that and afterwards or now it is a privileged neighborhood it is really one of the booming districts and with this change also a change of the tenants and of the inhabitants comes along what's happened to transit in this area with all the changes to the streets yeah um, now it is nearly a shared space it's not a real shared space because we have still this bus line or um, there is a bus line on the street and because of that it's not possible to appropriate the space really because the bus is, needs a certain uh, certain space and that's maybe a, a small point a small minus point <laughs> of the whole area yeah so where are we now now we are at the Europa Allee the European Alley it's a new district in Zurich in the heart of Zurich it's at the main, stage, main, main station. Who's developing this? Um, it's the Swiss Railway Organization who is developing this new district. And it's, um, I think, maybe it's a special case, maybe not, but in Switzerland the railway organization does own um, quite a lot of land near the railway stations in every city. And they are developing now a lot of districts. districts. What uh, is this going to be a, a walkable place that uh, is it going to be good for pedestrians? I think on one hand it will be really good for pedestrians. This alley is quite broad and as we know or um, it is quite important for a railway organizations to have a, a good walkability around the station. We know all the figures because you can improve um, the, the, the profit really really um, much <laughs> you can improve it and it's really important and um, the Swiss railway company the SBB does know about that and they are willing to develop um, districts with quite a high walkability and also um, an attractive possibility for other um, active mobilities also like cycling because under um, the floor there is the uh, station uh, the, um, there is a uh, possibility to park your cycle bicycle parking is at a <laughs> premium in a, in a, in a train stations uh, you know almost every place I've been to in Europe uh, you know it's great you get people to bicycle to the station but, but what do you do with the bike when you get there um, now what are the complications of having the railroad company getting into real estate yeah it's that's a point. Do you want to have a railway company or do you want to have a real estate company? And what if um, the railway company does own also land, land um, or farmer land of the city? And that's a bit ambivalent. But now at the moment they are developing um, a lot of districts, districts with public spaces. They, uh, I think in nearly every case, case the city is consulting them. They are in involved in a certain way. But um, the railway company um, has he, um, its own laws. They had, have kind of um, law of the house, so they can uh, send people away. And it's not public law, it's private law. It's kind of public-private partnership. And this is quite new in, or not so, um, so, not so ordinary in Switzerland. I think in, in the US it is, quite, um, it is quite ordinary. But in Switzerland it's, it's, it's rather new, let's say like that. And one of the problem is that if you have um, 
a railway organization which is um, constructing a complete new district with public spaces but also with um, a kind of or uh, like a business district with quite high um, rental fees you do attract not only ordinary tenants or it's not so social because for example here we have a headquarter of our Swiss famous Swiss banks and we have also the headquarter of Google um, so this does attract a lot of money and people with money so I let's use the term gentrification or even super gentrification this is certainly a place of super gentrification on the other hand the Swiss railway company is aware of its let's say um, ambivalent role and there are a lot of schools here also and a lot of shops in the ground floor are, um, are local boutiques and the rent is not so high there they try to balance or to find a balance so it's a difficult role and on the other hand there is or I can hear it quite often now um, what does gentrification and walkability or are or why um, no, no no let's say it another way around are pedestrians kind of gentrifiers and of course they are gentrifiers also because gentrification is, is a, a process of our society and the pedestrians are also part of this society and if the society is consumer driven or market driven so pedestrians will reflect that and part of the pedestrians um, are here in the city to consume, to buy things and so they are part of the gentrification also. So we should think about the system change if we're thinking about gentrifications and not about ah, yeah, maybe it's not so cool to um, make this street more walkable because then the gentrification comes along with it. No, 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 that's not the right way to think about it. You should think about, okay, we will uh, we, we try to make a city equal and free for everybody and afterwards we have to think about okay our society is structured not so equally maybe we should work on that also but not um, on the cost of uh, pedestrians we're in zurich switzerland talking with dominique buccelli with the swiss pedestrians association What difference are autonomous vehicles going to make for pedestrians? Um, they can could possibly make a huge difference because uh, autonomous vehicles are a disruptive technology. It's like the introducing of cars in our city or the introducing of the uh, railway in the 19th century. They will shift a whole lot of things around. So the question is, will it be good or will it, will it be bad for pedestrians? And it will depend. Let's look first at the, the nightmare scenario. They're terrible for pedestrians. What could they do that would be bad for pedestrians? Um, the thing is, if you um, do, um, uh, autonomous vehicles are private vehicles from private persons who owns them. They want that they can really go without interruption anywhere. So there will, really, will be a very strong lobbying that pedestrians only can cross the streets at certain points that uh, it's not allowed to walk on the, the lanes everywhere and they um, have no interest in walking because they uh, are driven by their vehicle, they um, are let it out in front of the building where, where they want and then the vehicle passes away to go parking so they have no interest in to walk anywhere, they need, don't need it and in such cases um, it's sure that um, parents will, will buy a car for their children too because you don't have to have a license that the car drives the children. So you have much more cars, they will drive much more and uh, for pedestrians it will be kind of some kind of a nightmare. And the other thing what you already see today in uh, places like uh, San Francisco, you have these delivery robots on the sidewalks and it could be that on the sidewalk you have this delivery roadbox on the street you have these autonomous vehicles and there is really no place left for pedestrians. Okay, and we want to avoid the nightmare scenario, maybe autonomous vehicles could actually be good. 
what, what, what would they have to do in order to be beneficial or at least not harmful to pedestrians? Um, I think the main point is start with autonomous vehicles in public transport. Make small uh, bus routes, uh, autonomous bus route, and because there you can, in rural areas, suddenly you can provide a uh, public tra transport which allows people to don't own their own car and then if you are done with the bus routes you go so to something like autonomous taxis so uh, it will be more a mobility as a service no one owns his own vehicle and so you are very you think about it oh should i really pay the taxi tariff or will I just pay the public transport tariff or, oh, it's close, I will walk. So it will be much easier for uh, everyone. And the thing is, what is important is that these new vehicles, they should apply to the traffic law we have today. We don't have to shift around rules and infrastructures, only that uh, this uh, autonomous vehicle can um, put in place. Uh, autonomous vehicles are being developed in uh all over the world. Uh, what's the situation here in Switzerland? Uh, you know, what, uh, who's, who's going to be in charge of, of making decisions about them? Um, it's clear it's here our uh, national uh, road, road, road department. So they, um, they, I don't know how good they will decide. So I think it will be needed a much part of lobbying of civil society that we going in the right direction because they have some kind of thing. Oh, we want them that they can enter the, the country won't be good for this uh, industry. And I don't think this is the right, uh, the right position. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.